want to talk to you about something. I got laid on my heart about a month ago to share with this with you for about a month during the Christmas season about this. And we so so easily forget that this is the only thing that matters. Love. Um, we we start focusing on what kind of Christian we are, how good we can be, uh, the struggles that we have in our own flesh, you know what I'm talking about? You know, that struggle that you have. Um, we start focusing on all of that, and that is, I want to say this to you, that's the devil. You're like, well, it's the devil challenging me to become a better person? No, no, it's the devil accusing you. The Bible says that we can overcome the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That's it. The word of our testimony is not all the good works that we did. It's the fact that Jesus loves us even though we suck. Amen. We overcome the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And our testimony is, God used me even though I didn't deserve to be used. God loves me and he considers me a part of his kingdom even though I'm not good enough to be in his kingdom. That is our testimony. Anytime we begin to praise God about anything other than that, it's pride and we will rob ourselves and the people of God, the glory and the kingdom of God. Anytime, I promise you. Happens every time. The day I start bragging about what God, what I am accomplishing, what God is doing through my life, is the day that I begin to take the glory off of God and begin to put the glory upon myself. Even if I don't say it, I infer that God used me because I put myself in the right place. Bam, that's pride. The only place that should be shared is in an atmosphere of teaching people, discipling them, that hey, in order to become somebody, in order to become useful to God, you must be in the right place. Any other time that is shared, you are being prideful. You're drawing attention to yourself and the works that you have done instead of bringing glory and honor to God. The fact is, every time God uses me, it should be, thank God He used me even though I'm not good enough for Him to use me. That's the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Not... Last week, I fasted and prayed three days, and God used me to do this. <clears throat> the only time that is appropriate to share with anybody is in a teaching format where we're teaching someone how to be a disciple of Christ, and we're not doing it as I or me. It is, if you want to be brought closer to God, die to your flesh, one of the great ways to die to your flesh is fasting and prayer. Amen. We can get so caught up in being a Christian and doing all the Christian stuff that we can forget what's really important. And I can tell you this from personal experience. If you will focus on love, the love of Christ that he has for you and that you have for him, and then the love that he commands us to give to others, you need focus on nothing else. That's not my formula. That's scriptural. There's two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, body, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two commandments that Christ says... He gives us. And he says, all the other commands will be found in these. You will, you will keep all the other ones eventually if you find yourself in these two things. I love God. He, he realizes we're simple-minded fools. <laughs> One, two. One, two. <laughs> it's so much easier than ten or fifteen hundred. One, two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, body, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. <gasps> I can focus on that. How many of you can say, I can focus on that? Let me tell you something, folks. If you would focus on that, you don't need to focus on anything else. Because as you focus on your love for God, He will bring you to all the things He intends for you. But man, we can get caught up in why God used us and how 
God used us. And if God's going to use us. And if God's going to bless us. And when God's going to bless us. And all the things I need to do to get myself in a place where he'll bless me. And we're missing the point. see the point. No greater love than this. Go on. <coughs> greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for one's, one's, one's life for his friends. John 15, 13. Go on. The love of a mother or a father has toward their son or daughter. This love is so powerful we almost think it comes automatically like a parent doesn't have a choice but to have that love for their child. And, and most of us, we think that, but that's actually not true. I've seen something very different. Have you ever seen mothers and fathers not love their children? Yeah. We, we would like to think that it's just natural, but it's not natural. Um, what about those things that do, what about those that do evil and unthinkable things to their children? Uh, like walk into a school and shoot 20 kids. <laughs> Can we love them? Do you think, every once in a while I get in the flesh and I have the mindset, I'll love them while I send them to hell in Jesus' name. Um, but that's not God love. That's Mike love. Next slide. The love of a young man or a woman has to lay down their life for the freedom of others. That's good love, isn't it? Many young people go into the armed forces for the college money and are changed by experiencing the power of selflessness and the power it has in their life. I have a question for you. Would we have a armed forces if we didn't pay people? Oh, yeah. 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 It's just a question. <laughs> Think about it for yourself. Yeah. Go on. This love is not automatic. The love of God is not automatic. The love to lay your, your life down for your friends. It's not automatic. It's not natural. You realize that, right? Many times in society, we conveniently explain away our social problems due to some disease. The fact is, we will never be cured until we come to the knowledge that these problems are a result of our decisions to serve ourselves or others. If you really want to get down to social problems, we could solve them all if we taught people to love the Lord <coughs> and love their neighbors. Our founding fathers believed this, and they set out to create a society that was like this. And this country has changed the face of the world and humankind as we know it. We have been a light on a hill. A people that claimed Jesus Christ, whether they were good enough or not, all of you that say, yeah, but Thomas Jefferson was sleeping with his slaves and blah, blah, blah. Whether they were good enough or not, they claimed the name of Jesus they loved the Lord God. And they set out to create a society that was like that. And we changed the face of the world. In the last several years, we've denied that. <laughs> we've reputed it. We're not a Christian nation. Somebody's like, yeah, we are. No. The president that you elected said we weren't. I heard it with my own ears, if you want to argue. He said it more than once. They don't see any value in being a nation that claims Jesus Christ. And we've turned away from it. <coughs> 
Selfless love. We've lost faith in selfless love. You don't believe me? We don't think the sick can receive healing without forcibly taking other people's money. We've lost faith in Americans to have selfless love. Do you understand this? We don't trust that God will provide for us and that there are people out there that love God and they will be moved to provide for people for whatever reason that cannot provide for themselves. Now we only trust force. We don't trust love. And here's the problem with that, Dan. When we trust in love, the love of people, the love of people to love their God, there's hope in that. But when we trust in force and mankind to gather together and force others to give what they have so that others can have what they have, when we trust in that, we see flaws in the system consistently, don't we? They're everywhere. And it's a man's system. And we're going to see the flaws, and the flaws are not going to be fixed. They cannot be fixed. And people don't have hope. Because we've not taught them to have hope in the Lord God Almighty. We've taught them to have hope in themselves and in others. stupid retards is what we are. And I don't need to offend anybody. Yeah. Christ is a man who trusts a man and makes his flesh and strength. Duh! No wonder people have no hope and go stupid. Think about it. No wonder they lose all hope for anything to change in any because they're putting hope and trust in man's ability to make things right. When you put your trust in the Lord God Almighty and you put your love there and you choose to love others rather than yourself, you're putting hope in something bigger than you. And you can hope on it till the day you die. And even if you don't believe in God, I'd rather hope on something the day I die than to trust in man. Most of you are like, yeah, I, I can see that. But then when you add the fact that I know God's real, I'd rather hope on God all day long. See, not only have the people who are getting the goods and services lost hope, and they've turned away from God. They've turned away from loving God and serving Him and trusting God that He'll provide for them and trusting and loving and serving other people. Now they're demanding, they're sitting at the table demanding their stuff right now. If you don't give me my stuff, I'm going to lose hope and who knows what I'm going to do. You ever hear that, Kay? I don't know how much longer I can do this. Do you know that's a threat? Somebody says, I don't know how much longer I'm going to do it. I always say, and then what? What are you going to do? Don't blame me for it. Here, why don't we just end the suffering? I'll just take it away from you now. How's that? <laughs> We've lost hope. The people that are in need no longer look to Jesus Christ for their hope. They place their hope in other people. They place their hope in government. Which is other people. You know that, right? And what are other people considered? Flesh. First is a man who trusts in man and makes his flesh a strength. God. And now we become, we went from being a blessed nation to a cursed and bankrupt nation. You're like, dude, this really stinks. Of course, it's not a message of hope and positive and encouraging. 
Sure it is. You know why? Because I don't trust in man. I don't love man. See, <laughs> if you follow all the way back to our social problems, you'll find that it's people who they choose to focus the most powerful thing on the face of this earth's energies towards. Do you know that the most powerful thing on the face of this earth is love? It is the most powerful thing. And the amazing part about love is it can't be measured. You can't box it and send it to anybody. It's like supernatural. I, in my little sick and twisted world, I like to think of the supernatural world and the physical world. And it's like love is just a little boom. Supernatural world comes by and goes boom. Boom. And to me, the most powerful thing in this world is love. And I'm not the only person that thinks that, by the way. The most powerful thing human beings know is love. And we're putting our love towards something other than our God. All of our social problems go back to, what do we focus this energy on? Do we focus it on ourselves? Do we focus it on our children? Boop, boop. Do we focus it on our families? <coughs> do we focus it on our careers? Do we focus it on our church? Our government? Helping other people? Or do we focus it on our God? See, whenever we focus this powerful energy that each and every one of us has on anything but God, we curse ourselves. Because what we do is we're putting our hope in something other than God. This is the most valuable thing each and every one of us has. Wouldn't it make sense that if I took the most valuable thing that I have... Where I placed it is where my treasure is. Amen to that. If I put my love upon family and things and other people, that's where my hope is. You're going to be sorely disappointed. You're going to lose all hope. And you're going to go stupid. But if I take the most valuable thing I have, and I place it upon God, my hope grows. It's not disappointed. He comes through every time. It might not be the way I wanted him to, but oh, he comes through. Why do people do drugs, Kay? Because they put their hope in how they feel. <coughs> and they're taking drugs to change how they feel because that will fix things. Why do young ladies sleep with multiple partners over and over again and just use themselves up? Because they're putting them, their hope in being valuable and important to somebody. And for that one night, they got to feel like they, somebody cared about them. And then they felt dirty and used. It goes all the way back to the one thing I have. The most valuable thing I have is my ability to love people. My ability to love. It's not automatic. 
Many times in society, we conveniently explain away our social problems due to some disease. The fact is, we will never be cured until we come to the knowledge that these problems are a result of our decisions to serve ourselves or others rather than God. Yeah. I should write a psychiatric journal. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> The love of God to send his son to die for us when we didn't deserve it. Do you think he had a choice? Do you think Jesus had a choice? No. Yeah. Was he forced to die for us? No. no. It was his decision that made it so powerful. His decision to spend his love where he was supposed to. Our decision to love is what makes it different. Where are you going to place your affection? I love that song because the woes are my time to just act like an idiot in front of God. Just like my little girls do when they stand on the on the ottoman and they dance and Daddy, watch this. Daddy, watch this. Daddy, daddy, daddy. And I don't have to worry about what I'm saying. I can just get lost in my affections towards my Creator. You guys are, some of you have sat there and you're singing, you're like, what are they doing? Well, we're loving our God. Don't you want to love your God? Don't you want to give your God your affections? That decision you make to give God your affections will transform your life. If you don't, you bring curses upon yourselves. You don't believe me? I challenge you. I challenge you. Try it. Next slide. John 15, 12, 17. Oh my goodness. There we go. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. <coughs> Next slide. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who is, does not love, listen, we know that we have passed from death to life. Death to life here. You know what that means? From a sinner to saved. From a child of God, from, from a lost child of God to a found child of God. He says that we know we have become a true child of God because we are able to love one another. So when we don't love one another, what does that mean? Yeah. We remain in darkness. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Oh, here we go. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Why well, come to church to be blessed, Pastor Mike? To be encouraged. I don't mean to be rude here. We live in such a consumerism mentality that we all just take. 
we, we go and we take and we, when we do give, we, we measure what we give very carefully because we're afraid we might run out for ourselves. Which means you don't know who God is. What do you mean? Uh, number one, there's no place in the scripture that talks about balance. Other than for justice. There's no place in Scripture that talks about be careful not to work too hard. Did you know that? There's no place in Scripture that says don't be careful not to uh, don't be careful uh, not to uh, uh, give too much of yourself because you might not have enough for yourself. There's no place there. There's all kinds of places that talks about God being the provider, that God being our sustenance and our, and our power. That God restoring us. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we all lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in the, His presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and He knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and receive from Him anything we ask, because we keep His commands, and we do what pleases Him. And this is His command, to believe in the name of, of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He has commanded us. Next slide. Is it love when you're getting something in return? Mm -hmm. No, it's love when you don't care if there's anything for you at all. Chris, you want to go out there and grab those there on the front table there, right in front of the door. If anybody wants one of these little things, these little things right here, these little pamphlets, raise your hand because I'm going to go through it real quick. It was funny. It's one of the, these. This is one of those things. I went back to my old notes and I read it and I was like, dude, did I really write this? This is really good. <laughs> The power of love, the cross, the gift of God, for he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son just so that someone might be saved. No guarantee that someone would be saved, just for the hope that someone might be saved. Not for the right to force us, but simply for the hope that we might accept him. Could you please keep your hands up quietly? Thank you. Ed. <laughs> Don't worry, Ed. It'll be okay. We'll wait till he's done passing out. Okay, you're you're all out of luck. I'll give you. I can make more. I'm sorry. We'll let him. Let him. I think you want the cross, the gift of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son just so someone might be saved. Not because he was going to force someone to be saved. Not so that he had a right to make us be saved. But for the hope that someone might believe in him. How many of you lose your passion for obeying God when you don't get the results you were hoping for? That means you don't understand love. Your love for God and for others should not even fade one bit, regardless of the circumstances or the results. And that is one of the hardest things to do in the world. Especially, some of you guys are like, Man, I, I, I tried it, and I was really loving people and loving my wife and trying to sacrifice for her and give her, 
you know, just give her affection and, and die on the cross for my wife. And, and it's been a week and nothing's changed. And I want to look at him and go, yeah, imagine like giving up your whole career, giving up hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, giving up the right to raise your kids the way you want to raise them, just so that you can spend time loving people and then they talk trash about you. Man, if you can't love somebody just because God told you to and they don't give any response, what are you going to do when they turn around and crucify your butt? And say, he's going to cry. <laughs> what are you going to do when they mean to you because you died on the cross for them? What are you going to do? Well, and this is where these pastors are out there talking about how Jesus died on the cross so we don't have to. They should go to hell and not pass go. They should go immediately to hell. I mean, because th those people, they have no clue what they're talking about. The whole point of experiencing God is to love God and love others and be mistreated while you're doing so, and experience the power of it. And for someone to tell a Christian they don't have to get on the cross, means they don't want that person to experience the power of God. Where was the power of the resurrection? After Christ died. <laughs> If you want to experience resurrection in your life, what must you do? Die. die. Christ said, unless a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it cannot produce. <coughs> if you want to live, you must be willing to die. So, I just, people who say that just drive me crazy. People that think that being a Christian means God's going to make your life better. That means they don't know who God is. <laughs> That's what that means. God, God doesn't make your life better physically through circumstances. It might happen, it might not. If that matters to you, you're in trouble. <laughs> what are you going to do when God blesses you and then he requires his blessing that he gave you? He requires you to give it to somebody who doesn't deserve it. What are you going to do? Cry. <laughs> You'll be praying more than you've ever prayed in your life. Oh, God, please don't ask me to do this. God will be like, finally, I got you to pray to me. <laughs> now that you know I'm requiring that thing that you love. <laughs> Christ didn't die on the cross so he could force us to love him. He could force us to love him. There's no greater power in the entire world than Christ's love. And this love that people willingly give themselves for others, expecting nothing in return. To just have the opportunity to be in the situation, to show this love to others. That is what our lives are supposed to be about. It is, only reason, it is, it is the only reason we are still here. Otherwise, Christ would have, we'd have given our life to Christ if he would have taken us to be with him. <coughs> We're to show him... <coughs> We are to show this world the love of Christ, not by talking to them about it, but by showing them. And you can't show somebody something you don't have, that you're not willing to give. The only reason we are still here is to show the love of Christ to people who do not know it. And how did Christ show his love for us? By sacrificing himself and trusting God to raise him up. To just have the opportunity to be in that situation, to show the love, to, this love to others, that is what our lives are supposed to be about. It is the only reason we are still here, to show the world this love that Christ died so we might know him. 
There is nothing more awesome, nothing more breathtaking, nothing more dumbfounding, nothing more awe-inspiring to, to see nothing but love give someone the ability to turn from that addiction. To see their hearts melt and the years of pain and shame fall to the ground as though it was mud in a shower, the shower of supernatural love, the love of choice freely received and freely given. Kay sees it. Thank you, sir. Kay sees it all the time. If you don't know, Kay's involved in a, a drug therapy program, and she does uh, Bible studies with them. And the little bit of love you show them changes things. Just a little bit. What's the problem, though, Kay? Finding enough people to do the love, isn't it? Absolutely. They can't find enough people to love. Not enough people that need love. Oh, no, no, no. They can't find enough Christians that understand the power of love. Of giving it freely, expecting nothing in return. Well, those people might hurt me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> what? Well, you don't know what kind of people... I don't care. If God's called me to love them, I'm supposed to love them. We sit and we see these people and they're struggling with addictions. All they need is love. All we need is love. Da, 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 da. Oh, sorry. You know what's so scary about that? Is those dorks get it, and we're trying to shove the Bible down their throat. Well, this is what you need. You need to hear this story about how... No! They need you to love them. God might cause you to use the word, but that's not the point. The point is you loving them. I'm here to tell you, folks, it's a kingdom principle. A kingdom principle means it works regardless if Christ is involved or not. That's why there's non-Christians that will willingly lay down their lives and love people, and they see results. It's a, and God has nothing to do with it. They just want to be good people. You've seen them, haven't you, Kay? And you know what's scary is, there's more of them than there are Christians because the Christians are still in Bible school trying to figure out how to be good enough. Amen. Because they're stupid. It's absolutely ridiculous. Jesus, the Holy Spirit will teach you what you need to know. Now get out there and love people. I need a certificate, Pastor Mike. Here, let me write you one. <laughs> so I think that's what we ought to start doing, Phil. You were such a good job at making certificates. We ought to do that. We ought to, we ought to make certificates, and every time somebody says they gave a life, their life to Christ, I'll sign it for them and say, here you go. You're now certified to love people in Jesus' name. <laughs> yeah, we'll frame it. We'll bring him up on stage. Is that what, is that what it takes? Is that, what, is that what it takes to get you to understand that the love that God gives you, that you're willingly, freely giving to people when they don't deserve it, and you're not going to get anything in return, that that is the most powerful thing you could ever have in your life? That's what changes people? Do you know what my one problem is in ministry? It is not lack of scripture knowledge. It is not lack of prayer. It is not lack of uh, personal alone time with God. No, 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 no. My one struggle in ministry is lack of time to love everyone that God brings into my life. I've never, I've said this over and over again, when I teach 
this about love and the power of God. I have never, ever, ever had a problem not having enough people to love. I have never, God will bring them. He'll bring them by the thousands. He'll bring them by the tens of thousands. But he ain't going to bring them by the tens of thousands if there's one person that will love them here. He'll only bring the amount of people that we're capable of loving. And if you've only dissected an hour a week to love people, well, you're going to get the results of your hour. All you're showing me is you don't believe in the Lord. What you're showing me. You know, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've liked to look at my life as uh, I'm trying to be a living example of how people should live their life for Christ and not live their life for their children and not live their life for their wives or their husbands and not live their life for their career and not live their life, but you live your life for Christ and you go and you do whatever God told you to do regardless of the circumstances and the consequences in your life. You obey God above all else. And I think, man, if I could just, but some of the results haven't come true yet in my life and, and, and so you all have to wait around and God's like, Mike, you don't think you're the only guy doing that, right? I'm like, no. And so I began to pray, God, bring other people into our church. Bring other circumstances into our church to show people that this lifestyle works. Because you don't believe me. I argue with you guys all the time. No, you don't. Oh, yes, I do. What do you think I get passionate about up here? You don't believe me. Some of you are waiting for my children to be all messed up because I don't spend enough time with them. <laughs> I'm serious. You don't believe me that serving God above everything else is the best way to live. Amen. Guaranteed. I don't need to worry about spending time with my kids. I drag them with me. I freed them from the bondage of the government. Now I can have them whenever I want. I'm not enslaved to the government's schedule that they tell me when I can have my kids and when I can't have them. <coughs> if I want to go somewhere and see somebody in a hospital, I can go. And I can take my kids with me. And I don't have to give anybody an excuse notice. You got to see it from a different perspective. Do you really believe me? I've never had a problem finding people to love. Every time it's finding enough people that will do the loving. I was so encouraged last night. I was sitting in the kitchen with a bunch of old people. Amen. Do you know how exciting that is to me? <laughs> you understand? It's Saturday night. We have a building full of heathens. <laughs> it's an understatement. You're right. Teenage heathens. There, that's better. Yeah. And I'm sitting in a room in the kitchen with four other old people. I won't name them. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm so excited about that. Because they believe if we just love these kids. God's going to do something. And he does, doesn't he, Catherine? Doesn't he, Eva? He does. Well, what did he do? I don't really care. I mean, when I see it, I know, oh, there it is, there it is. Last night, one of the adults testified in our, in our exit meeting. We always have an exit meeting. Talk about what God did. I don't want to leave and not just go 
hope God did something. I want these young people to see that God does something every time we get together. And one of these young ladies left the building, and as they were leaving, they looked at Angie and said, you know, this place is kind of like the dad I never had. Cha-ching! 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 Woo! Woo-hoo! What? That's how I felt. I just wanted to dance. I wanted to... Well, uh oh, uh oh. Because score! Chuck what I forgot! Yeah! If there's one kid, one girl that we impart that, hey, you know, I don't have to give myself up to that boy to, to feel valued, score! If there's one kid who comes in and out and in and out and in and out, and then when, they're, when they turn 20, they finally, it clicks in their brain and they get it, and they start serving God, score! I might not be around. They might move out of the state and go to another church. I don't care. Who knows how much God's doing? But I know He's doing it because we're willingly sacrificing of ourselves to minister to people. That's all that matters. And I believe it so much that I don't need to see any results. We have our meetings because some of these young people need to see the results. I, I've, I've been serving God for so long, I only see results. I know it works. God chastised me this morning as I was praying and preparing for my sermon. He chastised me of my, my anxiety over the last week. Some of you are like, well, it's natural to be anxious about what you went through. Folks, have you ever had somebody fly you halfway across the country? Nope. Just to possibly fire you? <laughs> <laughs> it was a little nerving. I, mean, it was a, I was anxious. And God's chastised me. He's like, Mike, really? Did you think I was just really? And I was like, God, I don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> He was like, but you were worried. Yeah, I was. Yeah, you might not have needed to know what I was going to do, but you didn't have to be worried. Didn't you believe me? I believe it. I... Uh. <laughs> Sorry. What's going to happen for you? And you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and you feel like crap today and you wonder if God's really there. Okay, well, we'll start there. Because you know, your unbelief in God about that is just the same as my unbelief in God about my situation. It's all relative to where you're at. It never goes away. You always have to, he always challenges you. He never leaves you where you're at. You're never going to arrive where God doesn't mess with you anymore. Once that happens, you'll be in heaven. And I still think he's going to mess with us there because that's just his nature. But then it'll be like practical jokes, you know. Well, he'll, he'll call us into the throne room and we'll walk in and water balloons will fall on our heads and God will be like, yeah! <laughs> we'll be like, really? Really? He's like, hey, I'm the Lord God. I can do what I want. <laughs> Except then we'll know he loves us. We cannot give this love that I'm talking about until or unless we have received it. Unless we have needed it. Unless we have not deserved it and we still receive it. <coughs> this love cannot survive in, in the one who feels they deserve it. It cannot be where it has been earned. It can only inhabit the one who is humbled by its mere presence. 
it will continue in the one that gives it freely with a sense of unworthiness. Really? Well, no wonder here. Yeah, they didn't put anything in Good Lord. It cannot survive in the one who feels they deserve it. It cannot be where it has been earned. It can only inhabit the one who is humbled by its mere presence. It will continue in the one that gives it freely with a sense of unworthiness. Not a, of guilt and shame, but the heart that is overwhelmed by the power of such love in them. By the power of love that is exclusive to Jesus and those that live for him. Have you experienced that kind of love in your life? If you haven't, you don't know Jesus Christ. You don't need to say a prayer with me this morning. What you need to do is make a decision in your heart right now to receive Jesus Christ. That's what you need to do. Whether it's in your mind or in your, with your words, you say, Jesus, I, I love you and I accept what you've done for me. You are my Lord. By the way, he can't save you until he's your Lord. Amen. Saving is a understood. The Lord is your, your, your responsibility. Making him your Lord is your job. If you haven't experienced that love, there you go. Ask him into your heart. Receive what he's done for you. Make him your Lord and you will receive it. Do you feel you need to experience love like that? I hope so. Maybe some of you have the ability to love like that. Is it one of the most important things in your life? <clears throat> if you answer no to the last one, then the love of Christ has not penetrated your heart to the point that it has transformed you. Do you love like Christ? I've been talking about. If you don't, you have not been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, it might be all over you, but you're fighting it, wiping it off. Because I, I can't see now. What are you doing? Let the blood of Christ transform you. Let it penetrate into your life and transform you forever. Jesus was the model for all of us to live by. The one thing he modeled for us that is more important than anything else is how to love. He was regularly moved with compassion for those he was called to minister to. This was the example. Scripture says no greater love can one have for his brother than to lay down one's own life for him. That is the kind of love that held Christ on the cross for you and me. That is the love that is given to us so that someone else might see that same sacrifice through the life we live. Folks, if you have to point to the cross for them to see the love, you've got it all wrong. They should see it in you and ask you where you got it. A love that is given with nothing expected in return. That love will change the life that is in its path, whatever life it is. It has changed my life, and God uses it regularly to change those that are around me. It is, it's in those times that I am worried about me that I overlook that one person that God has placed in my path to love. As a matter of fact, as I see God and know beyond any doubt that He is real in me, when I allow the Spirit of the Lord to move through me in love and see someone else's life changed, and then watch them surrender themselves to God. When I see that happen in the lives of those that I have contact with, it's worth everything to me. Everything. It's like, that is what I live for. To watch others be washed in the love of Christ. It's humbling beyond anything I could ever imagine. To watch them fuss in the presence of the consuming love of God. Oh, I love watching them fuss. Then it's like, oh God, I'm sinning. 
Because I like watching them fuss. <laughs> Even if they don't surrender to God, you still know that God loves them enough to show himself to them. The most amazing thing in this entire world is when he shows his love to them through my weaknesses. Through my failures and pains. It is honoring. It's sobering. To experience just a glimpse of what Jesus did on the cross. See, we all think that Jesus died on the cross, this victor. No, no. Jesus died on the cross with all of our pains, all of our sins. All of our sufferings. <coughs> and the Lord God used him on that cross with every sin of every man and woman on this earth from the beginning of time to the end of time to show his glory. All he's asking you is to put yours on the and he'll show his glory. Don't misunderstand me though. We cannot save others from sin through our suffering. No one can do that except Christ. But as the body of Christ, we will suffer as he suffered. And we will experience the same victory as Jesus did. That victory was not about him. It was about us. And his love for us. Why do you hope, or who do you hope, your victory blesses? Who do you hope your victory in the Lord blesses? to a new place in the Lord, or do I don't care, and I just want them to see God? Amen. See, Jesus didn't care. He just wanted to obey God Amen. and see the plans and the purposes of God come to pass. And that was us to be restored with our Lord. Do you want God to be blessed? Do you want you to be blessed? Or you want the lost to be blessed? I want God to be blessed. Because when God uses a sinner like me to bless himself, they say, Can I do that? When, when I get up here and I worship God, I don't care. I don't care if I can sing today. Sometimes I can sing and sometimes I can't. It's weird like that, Dan. I don't care. And we're up here just praising God. And there are some people like, is he really happy like that? Because if that's not a show, I, I'd like some of what he's taking. <laughs> Us humans are like that. We show up to a party, and if you show up to a party, gay there, and you're high and having a good time, your friends are going to ask you if you have some. Yeah. If you show up to life and you're filled with joy and happiness, and nothing can separate you from the joy and the love that you experience in Christ Jesus, your friends are going to ask you for some. They are. So if I bless the Lord in my sinfulness, because of Christ Jesus. My friends are going to be like, dude, really? How do you live your life like that? Maybe some of you are like, okay, Pastor Mike, tell me what I should do. Tell me what I should do. I want to live my life like this. Well, the first thing I would say is, are you sure? Because you know the whole dying on the cross thing. You have no clue what God's going to ask you to give up. None. So step number one, die to yourself. We have to die to ourselves. 
allow our flesh to be strapped to the cross violently with nails and hammers. Because it'll feel like that, trust me. No one says you have to like it. You don't have to have a smile on your face. I'm not going to judge you as if as God is strapping you to the cross, you are frowning and crying, going, ah! I'm not going to judge you, dude. Anybody that judges you for crying out when God is strapping you to a cross, they've never been on the cross. Amen. I'm not judging you for that. I might be like, good luck! <laughs> And if you really deserve it, and I'm like your really good friend, I might poke at you a little bit. Just because that's who I am. No one says you have to like it. But it is what must be endured. There can be no resurrection without death. There can be no victory without an enemy. There can be no win without an enemy that can beat you. See what I'm saying? If we want to live in that love, share that love, and see that love that we're talking about, change those around us, we must first die to ourselves and be resurrected into a new creature in Christ Jesus. A creature that loves where there was once no love. One that only fears God and one that can bring that love to others who are without it. How? It's a choice. To strap yourself to the cross. But it is the most rewarding choice you will ever make. And in doing so, you must completely rely on God and no one or nothing else, including the government, your family, your friends, your doctor, and your drug. No one. Step number two, share the resurrection love with those that do not understand it. Let them see your scars and your wounds, and let them see the love of Christ heal and restore you. Number three, I think number three is the hardest to do once you've conquered the second two. Remain in Christ. Do you know why most of us don't experience resurrection? Because we can't handle it. What do you mean? Look what God did. Do you know why he did it? Because I didn't cry when I was on the cross. <clears throat> We must remain in Christ. We must not forget it was Him who brought the victory. You know how hard that is to do. Especially for us arrogant men. It's like <laughs> being somebody who has been called of God to help people through these stages. It's like you get them through stage number one and you're like, that was hard. Stage number two normally comes easily. Because whether they're in Christ and they want to share what God's done with everybody else because they love everybody else. Or they're in flesh and they just want to share whatever, what God's done because they want to brag. Number two comes easy. It's number three. Number three is where it's at. Remaining in Christ. And you know what happens if you remain in Christ? God gives you a cookie, right? No, he asks you to get back on the cross. I've actually had him give me a cookie and let me eat it, and then take it from me. Like, I got it halfway down, and he's like, give me that. What? Indian giver. He goes like, really? Re really? Really? Remaining in Christ. Once, once we've gotten on the cross, and we thought we were going to die, and it seemed like we died, and God 
resurrected us. And it wasn't because we did anything. And, and then we share it with other people. And we see God transform their lives. And it's so exciting. And we feel like we're so worth something. And it's so easy to get caught up in who we think we are and how we got there. <coughs> no, we have to remain in Christ. And remaining in Christ means we realize He's the one. When we remain in Christ, if we don't remain in Christ, the next time he asks us to get on the cross, our response will tell us who we trust. Our response will tell us where our faith and our hope lies. We'll be afraid to lose what we have. You'll be afraid to lose what you've gained. Evan and I talk about this all the time. Evan keeps track. You're only keeping track so you can balance the scale. Why do you care? What does it matter? Why are you keeping track? Think about it. Remember? Wasn't it David? Was it David that sat there and took a census and went? Yeah. Yeah. Look at how, look at how <clears throat> the country's been blessed since I've been in charge. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Wasn't even his answer. You guys, some of you guys are <laughs> anybody into sci-fi or video games? You have this powerful love in your hand. It's the most powerful force on the face of the earth. When you when you open your hands, this bright light comes out. And you can throw it at people. And it hits them. And this bright circle bubble it encompasses them. Imagine the power of of the love of God in you like that. Because it's more powerful than that. Read the, po read the poets about love. Love has transformed the face of humankind. Love has set what? A thousand ships at sea? It's the most powerful thing. Not just physically, but supernaturally. I want you to imagine the power of God's love in your life like that. Do you even have it? What are you doing with it? Are you hoarding it so that you can have your best life now? Are you hoarding it so that you can be blessed? So that you're, oh, I've got to make sure I'm taken care of. Who cares? <clears throat> Give it freely. Well, someone might take advantage of you. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if someone took advantage of you? That means you're going to be up for more blessings from God because you're going to let people take advantage of you. Woo, that's exciting. You have more people to show the love of Christ to. Someone that takes advantage of you and you love them anyways and you show them Christ's love. Isn't that exciting? No? Laura, what does the power of that kind of love given to your husband do? Does it transform him? Does it change him in ways that nobody could change him? It does, doesn't it, Kay? Do you know how many people I've watched robbed of the glory of God in their life because they refuse to love their spouse? I've 
done loving you, buddy. I've given you all this love, and you've done nothing but take it and throw it back in my face. And if you're nasty to me, I'm not loving you anymore. Hey, folks, the only person that's getting hurt by that is the one that failed to love. Ain't nobody else getting hurt. Nobody. You know who's being robbed? The one that failed to love. That's who's being robbed. And the robbing won't happen just today. It'll happen the rest of your life. You don't believe me? Ask my wife. She was one of those ladies. She was married and her first husband had a son. And just left him because he was a jerk. I don't know how to put up with it anymore. I don't have to put up with this. He teaches Sunday school. He's a part of his, he's, he's a leader in his youth ministry in his church. He's a good guy to she did was rob herself. Like, well, look, look, she's, look. Oh, she had to lose her son. God might have restored her. Because God loves her. But there's no consequences. There's no consequences for her life. For her choosing to serve herself. And for the rest of her life, she has to remember that she lost her son because she chose herself. Nobody should have to put up with that. You're right. Nobody should have had to die on the cross for our sins, but they did. So that we might live. spouse that's hard to love, get over yourself. I want to ask you a question. What's going to happen to you if God sent your spouse, you, to love and transform their lives? You bail because it's too hard. Do you think that God knew what kind of scoundrel your spouse was? <laughs> you think God's going to punish the scoundrel? Oh no, no. The hardship's going to come to the one who says, I don't want to do this. This is ridiculous. I'll follow it up with this statement. I say, I don't know, I've lost track how many times I've said it. I said it, I think the first time I said it was to you, Kay. Kay, you chose him. Don't you bear some responsibility for your choice? Show this person the love of God to transform their lives. And then you're like, oh, dude, that's too hard. This is ridiculous. Do you know what kind of person they are? God's like, no, I don't. Tell me. <laughs> Enlighten me, O oh great one. Where were you when I separated the mountains from the ocean? When I told the mountain, you can't go any higher than that. Were you there beside me saying, yeah, yeah, that's right. No, you weren't even there. What do you think about this? What do you
you going to bring in your life when you say, that's too hard. I'm getting off this cross. That's just too hard. No one should have to put up with that. I've had people look at me and go, Pastor Mike, no one should have to put up with living like you live. I know, isn't it great? on your God and those that God brings in your life you're going to put your affections on your happiness your comfort your security your peace if I looked at you today and I said hey we're going to have sign ups uh, we're all going to go over to China and uh, we're going to die for Christ uh, we're going to go over there and we're going to sneak in behind enemy lines and we're going to share the love of Christ with everybody. And there's a 99.9% .9 chance we're going to get caught. And we're going to be uh, drugged through the town uh, by a jeep. And they're going to rip our body parts off. But in doing so, we're going to share the love of Christ with people. Don't raise your hands too quick. How many of you want to go? Cool. Now I'll never forget my second marriage. Pastor set my wife down, and he knew my answer. He knew that my answer was, "Yeah, let's go." As my friend said, Pastor, there's another pastor here in the community. He said, "If God told you to jump in a pool of sharks to preach the gospel." You'd be in this pool before you ask, you ask God what he wanted you to preach. I was like, yeah. He looked at my wife to be, it wasn't a bath, it was my second wife. And he said, if God called you to the mission field, if your husband said God called you guys to the mission field, would you go with him? What would you say to that? She said, well, I'd go if God called him. <laughs> and I thought that was a great answer in my foolishness. I was like, woohoo! Yeah, she qualifies. But what she was saying is, I'll determine if God calls us. <laughs> Whoops. Not to be offensive, but that wasn't her place. Folks, what's God calling you to do? You're lucky he's not calling you to go to China and die. Maybe he is. If he is, we'll pray for you. <laughs> Send us pictures. <laughs> we'll get you a satellite phone so you can send us pictures as they're pointing the gun at your head. Look. And see if you can hand it to him. Hey, could you take a picture of you killing me? This is for the sake of Jesus. Everybody in the world is going to see that you killed me for the sake of Christ. Neener, neener. <laughs> yeah, put this on YouTube when we're done, okay? <laughs> you guys think that's funny, but it happens. Unfortunately, they don't put it on YouTube. The people still hear about it. <laughs> What's God asking you to do? <clears throat> I'm sure it's not going to China. Is there anything any worse than that? Do you trust God enough to obey? Do you really believe that light that you have in your hands is supernatural and the most powerful thing in the earth? Because it is whether you believe it or not. Just as powerfully beautiful as it is, it's destructive when it's used to hurt. 
Folks, you can't hurt anybody any worse than hurting them with love. There's nothing, there's nothing more hurtful than withholding love from someone. Nothing. When you've showered somebody with love on a consistent basis and then you withhold it to control them, it is the definition of evil. Oh, I know how powerful this is, Pastor Mike. <laughs> I can get anybody to do anything I want. You're evil. This love wasn't given to you to wield as your power. God gave it to you freely. If you don't give it freely, you will pay. Oh, I don't know how you'll pay. But you will. And if I'm lucky, God will let me see a snapshot of it. <laughs> Listen, folks, I've, I've, recently I've experienced this. God has allowed me to see snapshots of the consequences of selfishness. It's supernatural. What are you doing with it? what changes the world. If you understand this, you can get set down right in the middle of wherever you're at and darkness gets changed to light. And it gets bigger and bigger as you share the love with other people. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You have to get by yourself first. You have to get by your self-righteousness. Get by that. Get by all these things that you got to do right. And just start loving people. Taking your love and compassion that God's given you and just start pouring it out on people. You might screw it all up. Oh well. <laughs> How are you going to learn if you don't screw up? Don't think that I'm not going to tell you you screwed up. I'm going to look at you and say, you screwed up. Don't do that no more. Yeah. Let's move on. Let's do this. Let's love one another. Let's love those that God puts in our paths. It will transform their life. <coughs> I got a buddy. He's been ministering to for 11 years now. Some of you know him. Old John. Just a little bit of love has transformed his life to some degree. How much more does it take? I think we should practice this. Anybody in the room, a statistician kind of person, accountant kind of mindset, you love to have all your things and Oh, that's right, those people can't stand to be at this church. You like to have all your stuff grouped together in containers and it's all nice and neat. Anybody like that? Tom? She's upstairs. Oh, Susie's upstairs. Yeah, she can't stand to be around me too much. <laughs> I drive her crazy. As I walk in, I move all the containers around. And go. <laughs> that's horrible. We should, we should try getting together and just loving people and seeing what happens. You should try it. Seriously. It's amazing. Try it in your life. The next time you're mad because you didn't get what you thought you should have gotten out of the relationship, stop. Put that on the cross. And then freely give to the person that took what you thought you deserved. <coughs> Expecting nothing in return. Let's see what happens. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this 
for your word today and your spirit that's here. I thank you that you love us. And I thank you that I know that you did something special today. In the lives of these people in this room. Watching on the internet. You've changed their life forever. Not because of my words. But because your love was revealed to them. Help us to know it only comes from you. We give you all the glory and the praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today, folks.